am so glad that you chose to join us for this edition of the Faith Builders broadcast. I believe that God's going to speak some wonderful things into your life, and the result will be victory in every area of your life. Before we get into the Word, I want to make you aware of this month's product offer, which is my book, Every Day is a Faith Day. And uh, the Lord spoke this to me some number of years ago. Uh, when I was reading Mark chapter 11, verse uh, 22, where it says, uh, have the faith of God. And uh, the Lord said to me, actually, I, I read uh, a translation that said, have the faith of God continually. And the Lord spoke to me when I read that, and he said, every day is a faith day. And uh, he explained some different things to me, and he said, some people's faith doesn't work because they don't exercise it every day. So that means we're believing God for something Every day, because every day is a faith day. I believe it'll be a help to you. Uh, it's uh, down to earth, easy to understand. I believe the Lord will help you uh, uh, in your understanding of what faith is and how faith works if you get a hold of this resource. And of course, the ordering information is there on the bottom of your screen, and you can uh, order that today, and I believe it'll be a true blessing to you in the name of Jesus. Well, let's continue with this that we've been on advancement through the Word and uh, in Mark 4, verse 24, Jesus made this statement, and he said to them, I'll read it to you from the Amplified Bible. He said to them, be careful what you're hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you, and more besides will be given to you who hear. So we dealt with this at length in our last session the pressure that we place on the Word determines the return we receive from the Word. All right? Now, that can seem simplistic in its, uh, in, uh, in its essence, and it is simple. But if you look at your life in general, the, the amount of pressure, if, if you want to see something happen in your life, wh whatever it may be, if uh, you want to save money, it requires you putting pressure on yourself to save that money. And it may include uh, budgeting your funds because I have found everybody has more money than they think they do. They just may not know where it's at. And so as you begin to budget your money and you give every dollar a job and you know where every dollar is going, Lo and behold, you find that you could save some money. Now, understand why I'm saying this. That may, that may involve not going out to eat. That may involve not doing some extracurricular things so that the position you're in can change and you can start putting some money back and saving some money because you want to get out from under that financial pressure. You want to get, right? But understand, if you give that a half-hearted attempt, you'll get a half-hearted return. Amen. But when you call your family together, you get your kids and your wife together, and you say, all right, guys, this is what we're going to start doing. All right? We're, we're going to start watching everything that comes in. We're going to start watching everything that goes out. And uh, uh, we're going to change some of these things in the name of Jesus. Well, what begins to happen? You begin to put pressure on that area of your life, and what happens? It begins to respond by a positive harvest in your life. Glory. When you begin to put pressure on the Word of God, the Word of God begins to supernaturally reproduce itself in your life. And when I say put pressure on the Word, I'm not talking about reading the Word. Only. I'm not talking even about just confessing the word only. I'm talking about living by the word. I'm talking about taking the word and really giving it your focus. And when circumstances or situations arise in your life, the first thing that you ask yourself is, what does the word of God say? That's how you're putting pressure on the word. I don't care what it is. Listen, I've dealt with people over the years that they've made mistakes. They failed in their life, even after they've been born again. And the enemy will try to beat them up with condemnation, beat them up with shame, and build them up, beat them up with guilt. And they'll come talk to me, and I'll say, hey, 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 what does the Word say? 
and they'll just kind of look at me. And I'll say, did you repent? Yes. Did you ask God to forgive you? Yes. Well, the Bible says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, here's my point in, in using that verse. So here's a person that's already forgiven by God, already, already in God's good graces, but they're not putting any pressure on the word, so they're not getting the return of the word. Amen. Now, I'm not telling you that you can go around and just premeditatingly sin and then go, oh, well, I repent, everything's okay. No, those verses are talking about somebody that finds themselves in a situation and they miss the mark and they fail. And he says, here's what you do. Confess it, repent, and I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a, good, isn't that a wonderful return on the word of God? But yet they're not walking in that freedom because they're not putting the pressure on those verses. Oh, hallelujah. But I didn't feel any better when I got done. It didn't say you would feel any better, but it said that you would know what had happened. If I know it happened, are my feelings first in line or second in line? Second. They're secondary. Why? Because what does the word say? The word says I'm forgiven. The word says I'm cleansed. The word says I'm in right standing with God. Oh, glory to God. So it's not just reading the word. It's holding to it. It's putting pressure on it. Even when you feel like you've missed the mark, even when you feel like things aren't going the way that they should go, even when you can look at the circumstance and, and it looks apparently in the natural that it's not changing, yet the word says it's changing. It's working. The word is working mightily in me right now, changing my situation, effecting a change in my life, effecting a change in my existence. I will never, 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 never be the same because I have come in contact with the living word of God. Hallelujah. And so he said that the pressure we place on the word determines the return we get from the word. And then we read Mark 4.20 where it says concerning the good ground, these are they that are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And we made the statement that these are not assignments. You are not designated to be a 30-fold Christian or a 60-fold Christian or even a 100-fold Christian. These numbers are the return on the investment the person made in the word. Amen. Uh, there, there's so many examples coming to me. You know, your relationships in your life are as rich or non-rich as the investment you've made. If you make an investment in your marriage, in your spouse, in your family, you'll get a rich return. But if you get no invest, you place, you put no investment in it. There's no return to be received. If you put a partial investment in, you get a partial return. But according to this scripture, it's possible for me to give 100% and receive a hundredfold return on what I gave. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Now, verse 14 of Mark 4 says, the sower sows the word. So here's the issue. Get a hold of this. The subject of this parable is the word. Not thorns, not rocks, not 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. The subject is what these hearers did with the word. What did they do with the word? Now, there are some enemies to the word. Number one, we see it here. Number one, the number one enemy of the word is Satan. Mark chapter 4, verse 15. These are they, they, they by the wayside, where the word was sown. When they've heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, understand, I've heard people say, yep, Satan comes immediately to take the word from your heart. Now, wait a minute, hang on. I, I present this to you, and you do whatever you want to with it. But he's talking about different types of ground and what happens to these types of ground. And it says the one that the soil by the wayside 
is where Satan can come immediately and take away the word that was sown. Why? It's laying on top of the ground. This is the hard pack. When you study this in the Greek, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the road between two fields. Now, I grew up in West Texas and grew up uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, ranches and, and agriculture. And between two circles of wheat, there's a hard packed place where you drive in and out to check the irrigation and you drive in and out to check the hot wire around the, the circle of wheat when you have cattle on it. Here's the thing. If there's seed that's sown on that hard packed ground, it lays there on the top and the birds, the enemy, can come and just take it away. You understand? What, what I'm trying to get you to understand is this. The devil can't just take the word from you. You've got to put it in a vulnerable position. Amen. So notice, the word heart here is the word cardia. All right, Mark 4, 15, these are they sown by the, by the wayside, the word sown when they've heard. Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, I have an illustration of this. If you remember in uh, Mark, I believe it's around chapter 6, Jesus had fed the 5,000. The disciples got in the boat and they're going across the, the, the sea and the wind starts and it says that Jesus had been up on the mountain praying and that he saw them toiling and that he walked on the water to go to them and he came up on them and when he got in the boat, all right, the, the wind ceased. Now we know that, that there was other parts of that that Mark didn't put in there about Peter walking on the water and different things. But here's something else that Mark puts in there. Jesus looked at them and asked them why they were so fearful, all right, and had no faith. And it says they had forgotten the 5,000. And then it says this, because their hearts were hardened because their hearts were hardened. So we're dealing with a hard heart here because it has to be received into the heart. So the word there for heart is cardia, and it denotes much more than just the heart of man. It refers to the whole being, the very core of the person receiving the word of God. So Satan has to snatch it away by force. The Weiss Bible, the word, the Weiss Bible says he snatches it away by force because here's why. The word has to be snatched away by force because he knows it has the potential to change the whole being, the whole life of the hearer. And if he don't come and snatch it away, if he don't come and grab it away, take it away, if it's, if it's left there vulnerable, if he doesn't come and snatch it and take it away, it'll change their life. Now, the enemy will attempt to snatch the word away through people. All right? That's, that's why the Bible says, uh, we read it in one of our first programs in Proverbs chapter 4, the word is life and health to those that find it. And then it says, guard your heart with all diligence because that's where the word is deposited. Guard your heart with all diligence. Amen. He'll try to take the word through people, through wrong teaching, offense, or through the thought, this thought, it's not working. I've often asked people, who told you it's not working? Is the word always working? Yes. The word's always working because Hebrews 4 says it's alive, it's active. It's alive, it's active. Uh, Jeremiah said, you have, the Lord told Jeremiah, you have seen correctly for I am always alert and active and watching over my word to perform it. 
Isaiah chapter 55 says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish the thing that I sent it to do. So is the word always working? Yes. Who puts a stop to the miracle action of the word of God? The devil? No, me. I put a stop to the miracle action of the word of God. The, the devil can have a hand in it if I allow it. Amen. I, I've told this story over the years, and I, and I won't maybe illustrate it in its fullness, but I remember when we were getting a hold of the word of God and Pastor Michelle was working nights at a grocery store and I would walk the, 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 the floor in the little apartment that we had and, and I would be uh, reading the word of God and reading the word of God and the enemy was just bombarding my mind with thoughts and bombarding my mind and, and that's when I really begin to say, uh, and, and I didn't have the whole revelation on it, but I began to use the phrase, I believe God. And the enemy would just bombard my mind and bombard my mind and bombard my mind. And I finally got to the place where I would take the word of God and I would just bury my head in the word of God. And I would say with all my, all my being, I believe God. That was my answer. I believe God. I believe what God said about this circumstance. I'm not, I'm not going to be an easy prey. I'm not going to let the enemy snatch the word from me that easily. E even if I make a mistake, I'm going to act on the word of God and I'm going to run right back to God and I'm going to act like I never made a mistake. Amen. Even though my heart may be hurting and my spirit may be broken and it may be contrite because I failed, I'm going to act on God's word. He said he loves me with an everlasting love. He said he's ever ready to show me mercy and grace and forgiveness. I got to act that way. I'm acting on the word of God. So the number one enemy of the word is the devil. Amen. The number two enemy, short root system. Short root system. Now you may be watching this online or on YouTube or whatever the case may be, and, and maybe, maybe you're not in a southern locale. That would be root, okay? Short root system. Uh, where we're from, we call it root, but just so you'll know. I had a lady that was from uh, Massachusetts, that attended our church for many years. She's in heaven today. And uh, I ministered on, on this one day, and she came up to me after church and said, Pastor, what is a root? And I just looked at her, and I said, well, you know, the root of a tree. She said, oh, that's a root. I said, well, okay, but you understand. All right, so just, just to clarify, Mark chapter 4, verse 16 it says, these are they likewise that are sown on stony ground, and when they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution rises for the word's sake, they are offended. Hallelujah. Now, I like this phrase in, in Spanish, because in Spanish it says, Pero como no tienen raíz, su vida es muy corta. All right, here's what it means. Because there is no root, the lifetime of the word is very short. Because there is no root, the lifetime of the word is very short. So the word was received with joy, but this person spent no time putting their roots down. The root system wasn't strong. The root system wasn't strong. So to get the maximum return from the word... I have to spend time sinking my root system deep so I'm not shaken. When you read in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 48, about the man that was building his house, it says he digged deep. And when the storm came, it couldn't shake him because he had dug deep. When it says immediately they are offended, the word offended means displaced, resentful, or indignant. So they got mad, they got resentful, they got indignant because for whatever reason they felt the word wasn't working and what happened? They were displaced. You don't ever have to be displaced because the word says that when you dig deep and you sink your foundation deep, that when the storm comes, the, the winds blow, the rains beat on that house, it won't move. You won't be displaced. Hallelujah. 
The third enemy is thorns. Verse 18, and these are they that are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. Entering in, what do they do? Choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Hallelujah. The Weiss Bible says they hear the word and the anxieties of the present age, the deceitfulness of wealth, the passionate desire with references to the rest of the things not in these categories. Entering in, choke the word, and it, the word, becomes unfruitful. So the word was working for this person, and they allowed worries, they allowed the deceitfulness of riches, making money their source, and other things that are not in this list to choke the word. They let them enter in, and the word became unfruitful. Hallelujah. Isn't it interesting that we have the power within our ability to allow something that is supernatural like the word of God to become unfruitful? Or by our application of the word, cause it to work to its optimum, optimum ability. Glory to God. So the word was working for this person. Notice, because it says it became unfruitful. In Matthew's account of this, it says the man became unfruitful. Here it says the word became unfruitful. What does that tell us? That when the word becomes unfruitful in my life, I become unfruitful. Now remember, it doesn't have to be that way. Because he said there was good ground that would bring forth 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. That's us. Everything I'm reading to you, th this is all just warning. Don't allow this. Because the word is designed to produce up to 100-fold in your life. Glory be to God. Look, look, at, look at your life. Just give a cursory glance to your life in the moment that we have here and, and see where God's brought you from, how the word has worked so mightily in your life. You know it wants to continue to do that? What if the word made the same amount of change in your life over the next 10 years that it's made in the last 10 years? I've been asking myself that. If the word would make the same change in my life over the next 25 years that it's made in the last 30 years, how would my life look? And you know, I definitely intend to live for at least another 30 years. Amen. That's a powerful thing to think about. I think you would say your life would be phenomenally different. And, and, it, and it may not even be that, that, you know, something bad going on in your life. But think about this. If the word will work to that percentage, that's how much better your life can get regardless of how good it is. Ever how good my life is, it can get better. Hallelujah. So if we put pressure on the word and keep it fruitful, we'll receive the results. Now here's the warning. If I don't put pressure on the word and keep it fruitful, other things will put pressure on it and cause it to be unfruitful. Glory be to God. Isn't God good? But the word will always work. Say it out loud. The word is working mightily in me. Say this. The word is producing 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold in my life right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you've joined us all this month for this wonderful teaching on advancement through the Word of God. Don't forget our product offer, my book, Every Day is a Faith Day. The ordering information is there on the screen. You can order that, and I believe that the Lord will bless you abundantly through the revelation that He gave us there. Until we see you next time on the Faith Builders broadcast, this is Pastor Philip Steele reminding you to please build your faith and 
frame your world by the word of God. God bless you. I want to express my gratitude to all of those who partner with this ministry. Thank you for being a vital part of what the Lord is doing in this ministry. At Faith Builders International, we are entering our 25th year. We've been broadcasting this program since 2010, over 12 years. During that time, we've received multiple testimonies of people who have been changed by the Word of God through this program. Our partners will receive the same reward that we receive from the part they played in helping us preach the gospel. King David established a precedent in 1 Samuel 30, verse 24, when he said, as his part is that goes down to battle, so shall his part be that tarried by the stuff. They shall part alike. A group of his soldiers had stopped the pursuit and not joined in the battle. But because they stayed with the supplies, the rest of the soldiers were able to ride faster and catch the enemy. David said they receive an equal share of the reward. And that's true about you. You receive the same reward. I want to pray for you. Lord, I ask you to minister to my partners out of the abundant overflow of your goodness and your blessing. Lord, for every time that they have sacrificed, that they have lovingly sowed into this ministry, let this be something, Father, that causes a memorial to come up before you and let the abundant supply of their harvest meet every need in the name of Jesus. We welcome you to join us too and become a partner of Faith Builders. Together, we will continue to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. This is Pastor Philip Steele, and I want to invite you out to Faith Builders Church, where people's faith is being built by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is moving in the lives of His people. You can visit us at either of our locations, either at 10500 Markham, right there in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, or 8390 Peoria Street in the city of DeSoto, Kansas. We would love to see you at either of our locations. We have a full service ministry. We have children's ministry from nursery age all the way up to teenage. We have ministry for men, ministry for women. The Holy Spirit is moving and people's lives are being changed. I hope to see you soon at either of our locations. Until then, build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.